Good evening and welcome to the second edition of Byline, a new public affairs program of Amherst Media in cooperation with the Amherst League of Women Voters. Uh, we're meeting every Friday night and uh, you'll see us uh, at 8 p.m. on Friday evening. And uh, this broadcast uh, tonight, it's uh, January 11th and you'll see the same show rebroadcast on Monday evening, 30 minutes before town council, if town council were meeting. They're not going to be meeting next Monday, but that's okay. We're still going to be on on January 4th, excuse me, 14th at 6 p.m. So if you missed it on Friday, you can see it on, on uh, Monday. And if you still didn't get enough of it, you can also go to Amherst Media YouTube and watch it as many times as you like. So this uh, show uh, is newly organized for the purpose of helping us all understand and get to know our newly elected legislators better. And today we have with us one of our new town councilors from District 1, Kathy Shane. And uh, a bunch of people did get to vote for Kathy. That's why she is here. But most of us didn't get to vote for Kathy because we didn't live in the district from which you were elected, Kathy. And so our purpose this evening is uh, to help the community get to know you better because every vote that you cast is equal to every other vote as every other councilor. And therefore, although you're representing your district first and foremost, you're also serving and affecting the lives of all of us uh, as you do your work on the council. So uh, we want to get to know you better and give people who didn't have a chance to get to know you during the campaign uh, season to get to know more about you. And so let's start with uh, experience. And uh, I read uh, your CV, which is quite impressive, <laughs> and you bring a lot to the council table uh, because you've been uh, a distinguished researcher, writer, and you've uh, worked in many different settings and many different issues. Why don't you give us a little thumbnail of uh, particularly the issue orientations that you've had that uh, are part of what you bring to the table and, and focus on, on uh, substance issues at this point sure. uh, as opposed to the skill sets. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, Stan. It's a real service to the broader community. Happy um, to do it. Thank you. I hope we'll be tapping into your links to the state legislature. Uh, when you, I'm available at any time. <laughs> you know, one of my, um, I, the experiences I bring in my focus, and one of the reasons a lot of people didn't know me in town, even though I've lived here 35 years, is I focused in, with a passion on trying to reform the U.S. healthcare system. I used to say fixing the U.S. Mm -hmm. healthcare system, whereas a good friend said, this is a lifetime yeah. <laughs> endeavor <laughs> if we're talking about access, cost, and quality. Yeah. And I worked initially with the Jimmy Carter administration, dating me back a long time ago, where we never got it through. And part of what I realized is we didn't have constituents pushing hard enough as a young kid Every surgeon wanted to take me out for coffee mm. or for a meal because I was going to write the bill. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't hear from real people. And I worked a number of years with a labor union afterwards, protecting wages, protecting benefits. I'm trained as an economist, so those skills are very useful when you have to look at numbers and come up with thinking through a better way that's going to bring sides together. And that worked well at the union level because management didn't always trust the union. But if you came in with a really good idea and it was going to save the hospital, people went for it, if, especially if you had a soft voice mm -hmm. and they could use your words. So I used that at the union level. And then when national health insurance started work, moving again was quite instrumental at a foundation that I work for is ideas, international comparisons, down to the local level, looking a lot at Massachusetts. You know, mm -hmm. what can we learn from states that are doing a better job leading the pack? But mm -hmm. where are they flawed? Where can we do better? So I do hope to bring that big picture on health care mm -hmm. to the council, but I think we can't fix it at the Amherst level. We need to be worrying about the state legislature and national and the focus on how do we pay for things, bringing those skills and a, an ability to analyze to the council. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the policy side, 
who gets what, when, how, why, but then there's the other side, which is what can we afford to do? Absolutely. And how do we afford to do it? How does that experience play into sitting at the council table? Uh, I, it's a fabulous question because it was uh, anyone who knows, and we all know something about the U.S. healthcare system because we experience it daily. Mm -hmm. And when we said we're going to do access, cost, and quality, people said you can't do all three of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we said we have evidence that we can do more and spend less on health care. So I think one of the things we can do at the council level is look at are there opportunities to be smart about the way we orchestrate our spending? Um, where are revenues coming from? Are there opportunities to enhance our revenues? Um, and think about the pieces, not just this year, which we have to do, but what does it look like five years from now and 10 years from now and keeping our eyes out into the future? Mm -hmm. And doing that, um, my experience both at the federal and often at the state level, is that was the winning strategy. <laughs> because what you do right now might bring you your dividends next year or two mm -hmm. years down mm -hmm. the road. So don't think too short term. Yeah. While, while focusing a lot on getting us through yeah. this year in a way that we are all proud of. So every time you sit down and have a conversation, you have to think about what's going to happen in the next 6 to 12 to 30 mo uh, 36 months to 10 years so that you're trying to make the best and right decision given that people need health care today, but we also need that system to be stronger and better three years from now and 10 years from now as the population grows as medical technology changes, et cetera. So that the, is that the kind of that, uh, direction that, that you were? That's uh, absolutely. And you, you know, when we, I worked on a commission for a number of years, um, and I was the central person pulling us together with the policy ideas and modeling. Um, but we had, uh, for example, the head of the partner's healthcare system sitting at the table with us. And we said, well, if we're going to pay you in a different way that will slow down your revenues but not bankrupt you. Can you live with this? And he actually said very quietly, I'm not going to say this publicly, <laughs> but yes, we can. We'd have to reconfigure the way we do things, but excellence could still be at the top of the line. And we could, instead of seeing healthcare like this in cost, it could be like this. Yeah. So we're not ever talking about yes. going back to 1950. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, it's but, not possible. But that's not possible. But yeah. again, it couldn't go even like this on day one. Yeah. It was a gradual... It's, it's, it's change uh, over time. It's change over time. So you're sitting at the town council. You have this enormous background on health care policy. You also have enormous background on economic policy and how you think about, uh, think about a problem from an economic perspective, not just from, from the health care delivery perspective. Um, how do you use that? You're on the council, you're not in the executive That's branch, right. and so, you know, staff have responsibility, but every year you have to pass a budget. Absolutely. And one of the biggest cost centers in our public budgets is health care. How do you, as a counselor, use your past experience and knowledge and the way you think about health care and framing health care policy as well as the economics of health care? How do you think you might be able to help without, you know, crossing the line from legislative to executive? Right. That is a great question. Um, you know, one, uh, one of the challenges we have as a municipal government is our, most of our revenues come from property taxes. Um, and we don't have the ability to think big the way a state government or a national government can on income tax as a source of revenue, sales tax, a different sources of revenue. And I'm trained as an economist, and my, my, one of my focus areas was always public finance. Mm -hmm. And um, yep. had to, I actually got brought in at UMass negotiations at one point where the university said they were broke mm -hmm. and they were going to do layoffs and furloughs. And I said, let me take a look. And it turned out they weren't totally broke. <laughs> there was a rainy day fund that was more than enough on a rainy day <laughs> mm -hmm. to do something. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things with the town is looking at our flow. Um, where are there opportunities to enhance it? Again, this year we might not be able to, but what can we do the next year? And I know the management of the town, which I think is excellent, is constantly looking for where's the grant money. 
Yeah. Um, but I think uh, a tight liaison with our state legislatures, if we got any change in the way the school charter formula works, mm -hmm. it's a huge Or benefit. even the, uh, the um, Foundation Review Commission funding, okay. if that came through. For our listeners, that was a three-year-long effort by a group of legislators with others to figure out uh, what we need to do to our Chapter 90 school funding formula and they discovered that there were several cost centers that were way beyond the amount that was allowed and considered as part of the Chapter 90 formula. In total, shorting our school systems about $1.4 billion. Yeah, it's huge. So if that, can, if that bill got passed, that would produce over five, seven, ten years a significant additional revenue tied to the very cost centers that we don't have enough money for, one of which is health care, so it, that brings it back to the Absolutely. subject of health care. Absolutely, and you know, I when I decided to run, um, one of the first things I did because of my training, and I actually like looking at numbers, was I got the most recent year's budget, and then I looked at several years backwards over 10 mm -hmm. years. And if you look at the amount of state money that was coming into Amherst, particularly for schools, um, yeah. it's dwindled as a share. <laughs> Right. Of the total, of the total so, budget, of yeah. the total budget. So when my kids went to school, they're 38 and 34 now. A mm -hmm. lot more of our school budget was state money, Correct. partly for what you're talking about, that yeah. the state hasn't kept up with the cost, and in some right. cases it went down, but it's been steady, yeah. and it makes a huge difference on one more teacher yeah. <laughs> uh, fixing the ventilation system um, or affording health care, which keeps going up. Yeah. It's not totally controllable. But on health care also, we've got legislators who have run on single payer, on doing something about costs. Yeah. I think there are a series of steps we could take. Massachusetts used to be a leader in thinking about what, what we pay for mm -hmm. across all our sectors, private sector, right. and we used to have rate controls. And if you, brought, right. if you brought the private, what we pay as private, just a little bit closer to Medicare. It's huge savings yeah. for, for the library, for schools. So thinking that way, it's not t tomorrow, but it's totally feasible yeah. um, if we are working But as you pointed out, that can't be done at the local level. That said, local. we all as voters and residents of the Commonwealth have a voice in that and can work with our local legislators who work on Beacon Hill and those in Washington to try to change those. Now you said something else that was very interesting to me. You referenced in maybe five minutes ago, you said, especially if you say it with a soft voice, <laughs> you were describing right. a process skill, not a substantive skill. Right. We've been discussing substantive skills around healthcare and economics and working with labor. But uh, talk about your what that comment, what you meant by that mm -hmm. comment, because yeah. I, I sense in, embedded in that is a way of, uh, of how you work and how you think people can work together and get more done. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of, it is a life, it, it's a learned skill, I think, that I didn't have on day one. But because I was often in situations where there were two sides, or at least there was a perception of two sides, mm -hmm. um, if I could And really sometimes more? And sometimes many more. Um, when you get to healthcare, <laughs> there there are many more. But if I can, you know, even five on the, people in the room and seven opinions. Seven opinions. <laughs> you know, if you got a commission together where it had the nurses, the surgeons, the doctors, yeah. the uninsured, yeah, right. the state legislatures. There you, go. you say, okay, lots is there, of interest. Is there a point of consensus yes. here? So um, one of the things I learned to do was listen really closely, and do a lot of homework. So I'd go back after hearing what everyone had to say and say, okay, let me think this through. And uh, if I needed to model it through, you know, someone said, could we do this? And like, what would that look like? And I could come back with a draft document or in the case of a municipality, I could find three places that had done something like, or a hospital. Oh, the hospital in Wisconsin did something like the California hospital wants to do. Mm -hmm. And I could write it up in a short, easy way to people understand and come in with a piece of paper. And if it was really adversarial, labor management, just pass it around and we'd start talking. And the best news was if at the end of the two hours, someone else was saying, I have a great idea. And they were looking down at 
what yeah. I brought in, which I didn't always author. Right. And suddenly we were all coming together around that set of ideas. Working with a group officially as the central person, so for example, on the council, listening to people, um, I would try to write things up if it was a new idea with sentences someone had spoken and they'd be reading so they could hear their voice they could hear their voice in this. absolutely yeah. and you know if i was working with the leaders of major institutions in healthcare you wanted their voice to be somewhere in the document particularly yeah. it was yeah. coming out as a statement from all the people but mm -hmm. but that ability to think through and analyze and not have to own it at the end so that's mm -hmm. what i meant about the soft voice um, so listening carefully synthesizing incorporating other people's voices and ideas, finding the common ground upon which to build the solution, and then finding the right way to present that so that it doesn't have to be me, me, me. Absolutely. It's us or it's you, it's not me. Absolutely. So that sounds a little bit like, it's not the same, but uh, the president uh, of the council, Lynn Griesmer, was on last week's show, uh -huh. and she talked about how she met with every single member of the council right. and really got to understand a whole lot more about them. Um, and there's nothing wrong in, in, uh, in the public sphere of having one-on-one -on -one meetings right. to educate yourself and right. to learn, but in that process, she got to understand a lot of how they thought, what they were interested in, what their skill sets were, et cetera. You're applying the same principles, but now focused on a specific problem. Absolutely. And, and often what you can do is you can find evidence for what you, know, you, you come to a strong opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that you're just sitting there as someone right on my slate. But, and you can find evidence to build that. And if you share that in a neutral way to people, you might want to read this article. You mm -hmm. might want to look at what so-and-so has done in this state or in this municipality. People go, oh, that's a great idea. Thank mm -hmm. you. You know, and it's just sharing, sharing information and bringing yeah. the information in. You know, the other um, thing, I, I'm, if, I, if we stood up, you'll see I'm not very tall, <laughs> and I'm clearly a female. So one uh, joke we used to have in a world of economists, we were often the minority if mm -hmm. there were economists. One would say, it's not going to be thoroughly said until he says it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you can say it soon enough, he will say it because um, there's uh, recognition of each other. We're colleagues and there's growing respect. So if I would come in with ideas, after a while people got to know me and they trusted me. They trusted me that I, was, I would spin the conclusion, but my facts would be accurate. Yeah. So it was a very good skill to have on um, that combination. And you spoke uh, in the, your couple of minutes at the opening meeting, mm -hmm. you spoke about um, um, independence and people being able to uh, be uh, effective as they were elected for their constituents, but also working together on the council. How uh, can you reflect a little bit on sure. how you can contribute to that as an individual member of the council and how the divisions in town can be healed through the how the town council works together and leads as a as a body sure individuals within the body and then the body yeah, as a whole. no I understand um you know one of the things I learned campaigning and I act to actually had to go out and knock on every door to introduce myself right. hi I'm Kathy is I asked everyone, I want to hear your concerns because I want to represent you. And that was the opening salvo. And sometimes it was the first half hour of the conversation. Um, so people, we have an amazing community in Amherst. And some of my friends who worked with me aren't in my district and they just wanted to get me on the council um, mm -hmm. because they knew what I could do. So what I want to be able to do is stay in touch with that group mm -hmm. But the issues in Precinct 1 and Precinct 3, which are District 1, yes. were often townwide. Mm -hmm. You know, they were very specific. Sometimes mm -hmm. the intersection in North Amherst is a mess, and yeah. we all know it. Mm -hmm. We've got a big development coming in. 
with four or 5,000 more car trips a day and like, oh my gosh, it's already awful. We need to do something. But they also were looking at the schools, uh, thinking about fire station, you know, other issues um, and worried about their taxes. So I think each of us on the council is gonna have to stay tied to the people who elected us but since the sh concerns are often shared concerns, building consensus in the town and building unity together, particularly if we could bring home schools would be mm -hmm. an example, um, we have an opportunity um, to come back and ask for a grant again for the schools yeah. if we can bring a divided town back together again. And I think the council could work with the school committee to build consensus, to build mm -hmm. unity. So a few big ticket items that people see us working together as the council, mm -hmm. tackling issues people care about. Suddenly we'll have a council, I'm hoping, two years from now or three years from now is to say, they're doing their job. They're mm -hmm. really representing us. They're focusing on things we deeply care about and we're not in a stalemate here. We're moving forward. So it sounds like what you're saying is how you work together on what you work what you decide to work on together, the combination of the two will create an environment in which everybody can contribute, be part of it, play their role as a council, school committee, citizens at large, and through that process you'll act in ways rather than having a philosophical conversation about what it means Absolutely. to bring the town together it will take specific projects and needs, addressing certain needs and projects, and how the people involved do it. Absolutely. And that's how you, you're viewing that. Absolutely, that's, I decided to run um, um, for several reasons. One, I, we, have a div we have a divided town going into this, and I think I can, I can help bring mm -hmm. peace. I have the time, because I retired from my 70 hour a week job where I didn't have the time, but I have the time to focus. And I think it's a real challenge to set up a new government. You know, so certainly it's, is. It's not, it's not just that we're, this is the way we do it. We're gonna have to say, right. how do we do how this? How do we do it? How do and we the do way it? you do it sets precedent and sets what the expectations of the public will be about either, no, we do not want you to do it that way. Right, absolutely. Or, you got it right, and we want all of our future counselors to Abs do it that absolutely. way. Absolutely. Even if it's not a written rule or a written uh, procedure, uh, how you work together, how you speak with each other, how you communicate, how you work with other people is, is the heart of the matter. Uh, and, and you have to go beyond the rhetoric of we need to come back together. Absolutely. You have to do work to come back together. Absolutely, and I heard that a lot um, mm -hmm. on knocking on doors. There were some people who were in the one side or other, others were just saying, can you move these issues, you know, and tell me how you would approach this. Um, uh, on de uneven development issues, you mm -hmm. know, one person said, I am so tired of hearing people say what they don't want. Mm -hmm. Can we say what we what do, we do, want, what we do right. want? And can we have a vision of uh, what we do want? And I yes. said, there's no reason we... Because we always want, we always don't want more than what we do want. <laughs> and, and so if you're focusing only on what we don't right. want, how do I know where I'm supposed to put my time and effort? Absolutely. You find that problem as a legislator all the time, and that's what you are now, a legislator. People say, I don't like this, but they don't have a constructive Absolutely. idea or response to what we should do. But it's okay. First say what you don't like, but now help me understand. And if you can find exciting you, you you can find ideas that suddenly go, oh, yes, yes, you know, this this could work. Now and speaking of ideas, in the last couple of minutes, yeah. again in your opening statement at the town council, you referenced uh, organizing a neighborhood association. Now you got two precincts that you represent in one district. What's your idea here? You're on a planning committee for this. What's the idea of this neighborhood association? Why is it needed? Why, uh, as a town councilor, whether you were a town councilor or not, would you right. still be doing that? Yeah. But now as a town councilor, what do you see your role in, mm -hmm. in that? Uh, because that, that idea was not put on the table by anyone else that I've heard so far. But I know transparency and accountability and engaging your constituents is a major responsibility based on the way the charter has been structured. Absolutely. And so 
Tell us your thinking about this neighborhood association we, and what you know. It, I'm part of a group, and mm -hmm. I was not even the idea person on this group. Uh, another person, it was, was her brainchild. But it, with town meeting going away, we all thought that it was really important that there be a way that counselors stay connected to constituents. And we came up with neighborhood association and started having meetings around issues that people care about. So we focused on the intersection by the North Amherst Library. We focused on getting a sidewalk down East Pleasant Street. And each drew in different neighbors. Mm -hmm. So one neighborhood was more concerned about others. We've done a potluck. We've brought the counselors back to talk to people. And campaigning was really helpful in building this because mm -hmm. I could say, um, I promise I won't email you, but if you would like to be part of a neighborhood association, I can put your name on a list, mm -hmm. and you'll get an announcement of the next meeting. We're going to try to do. And you can come or not, as you and choose. And you can choose, and we'll have agendas. We're going to have a newsletter. Mm -hmm. So the thinking is going forward. We will pick integrating kinds of issues that cut across farming, for example. We have farms, but so does the rest of Amherst. Yeah. So what are the issues of farmers? Yeah. Um, if schools start to have some choices that people can talk about, uh, when the budget starts moving. So we're building a platform of people that are raising their hands saying, I want to be kept informed. I don't always know when my issue is coming up, mm -hmm. and I would like to get involved before the decision is made. So I want to know early. Um, so it'll so be multi decision, a multi-issue organization. Absolutely. And there'll be a process within the organization for name for identifying priorities that will. But first, people have to have a chance of saying what they would like the group to work on. Absolutely. And then they self-select whether they stay with the group or not based upon what gets selected. Yes, and that and what we're hoping over time um, that we'll have a newsletter and some way of people saying. What's up? And how do I get my, you know, if, do you have anything for the March meeting? And here are mine. That it's fine if this group of 30 people is not the same as the last. Th Got in it. fact, that's even better because we've pulled other people out. We have a lot of low income living in um, not great housing. So affordable housing will bring a different group out. And so picking groups that uh, the outreach is the issue. <laughs> I want to come to a meeting so that's So we're going to about see over time how this evolves. So it is not another one in town at this point. So right. it could become a model. And we're, uh, hopefully we will come back to this again on your next appearance on right. the show. And we hope you'll be back um, uh, three or four times during the year because we want to have an ongoing conversation. And today was really about trying to get to know you a little mm -hmm. bit better from the point of view, f f given that so many of us actually didn't know yep. you and didn't have a chance to meet you as a candidate. And so thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us. And, uh, yeah, and we'll I look want to forward thank everyone, to, too, because yeah. this is just this, well, having the facility to do this in Amherst is rare. Other, oh, not every town has it. And it is an opportunity to speak more broadly to people that's, I think, an excellent idea. And they get better and better every day. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next week.